This is Digital Marketing Depot, broadcasting live. I'm Karen Burka, your webinar producer. Thank you for joining us today for How to Build a Comprehensive Data Strategy. We are very pleased to welcome John Donlin, Senior Research Director of Marketing Operations Strategies at Serious Decision, and Alan Pogorzelski, Vice President of Marketing at OpenPrize. Now, before I turn the webinar over to our speakers, I want to tell all of you a couple of things. If you need some help or have a question for our speakers, just use the Q&A box, and we will do our best to help you. If you want to tell a friend, check out our sponsor, OpenPrize, or Digital Marketing Depot. There are some widgets at the bottom of your screen. Just click on them, and they will take you where you want to go. Remember that you can customize your audience console to move or resize any windows that you have open. We are going to hear a lot of great content today. I wanted to let you know we are recording this broadcast, and we will make it available for viewing on demand this afternoon. I'm going to send an email out when it's ready. So with that business taken care of, let me make some more formal introductions to our speakers. John Donlin is a dynamic, results-driven leader who thrives on helping organizations accelerate the maturity of their business operations. He has more than 20 years of experience in marketing operations, as both a practitioner and consultant. Alan Pogorzelski leads the marketing team at OpenPrize, where he's helping marketers solve the problems with data and business processes that he's faced throughout his 20 years in marketing. Prior to OpenPrize, he led marketing at both large companies and startups, including Selectica, CypherCloud, and SoftChain. Now, audience, you can see more complete bios and contact information for our speakers on the left side of your console. Remember, if you have questions for our industry experts, please make good use of that Q&A box throughout our presentation today. I'll get to as many of those questions live after the formal presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Alan to get us started. Alan, there's your first slide. Thanks, Karen. Uh, today, I'm going to start by sharing with you a little bit about why we need a comprehensive data strategy. Uh, we'll talk about what one looks like, and then we'll talk about what you can accomplish if you have a well-thought-out strategy. But the majority of, of the webcast will be uh, John Donnellan talking about uh, what it takes to actually build that data management strategy from the ground up. So let's start with why we're here today. I mean, why do we need a data management strategy? Uh, and the answer is simple. Virtually everything that we do in marketing operations or sales operations or demand gen is driven by data. I mean, think about it. Uh, we want to know what campaigns are producing. We want to know what content is compelling to our prospects. Uh, we want to know when a rep should follow up with a prospect. And we want to know what accounts we should target. All of those things require really great data to work. Everything we do, it's data-driven. And the expression, garbage in, garbage out, applies more now than ever. And if you think about it, if you've got garbage on the way in, you know you're going to put money in the wrong campaigns. Garbage in, you turn off your prospects by pushing them the wrong content. You've got garbage going in, you're going to be going after the wrong accounts. And, and you're going to be missing out on those opportunities to follow up with prospects when they're actively researching you. And, and even worse yet, uh, you could end up following up 10 minutes after the right person did, uh, which is embarrassing to everyone. It's just garbage in, garbage out. Every process that we do in marketing and sales is driven by data and you need good data to be effective. Now, nobody intends to have a MarTech stack or a database that looks like the image that you see here, but the reality is most companies have something that looks just like that. And, and let's be honest, your average enterprise software sales rep isn't gonna tell you this, but if you're gonna buy a product like a marketing automation solution or a predictive solution or a sales management solution or an ABM one, um, those solutions are only going to work as well as the data foundation that it's built on. It's, it's garbage in and garbage out. Now, unfortunately, not many of us get to start by creating a data management strategy from scratch. Everybody has technical debt that they have to overcome. Now, for those of you who haven't spent time around IT folks, the, the term technical debt is a great term. It, and it, it represents all the baggage that you get aggregated over time by making a whole lot of decisions based on uh, the interest of speed or based on saving money rather than looking at the long-term implications. And that eventually catches up with you. Uh, so here's a couple of examples. Uh, let's say you, you buy a bunch of different technologies like marquee automation and sales automation. 
uh, in ABM. Now, each of those components have their own data silos. Uh, sometimes they're integrated together very well and sometimes not so much. Uh, and what you end up with is a really messy system of record. Uh, sometimes you get way too many moving parts uh, in systems where these different areas overlap. And you end up with uh, trying to figure out bugs every time something breaks. You know, I was in a meeting last month where there was somebody who wasn't paying attention, and it was because their lead routing system was broken. And there were a lot of very upset salespeople uh, all trying to figure what happened. And he had to debug four different systems to figure out where the problem was. Um, Certainly with core systems like Salesforce and Marketo and Eloqua and Pardot, you can end up overloaded with processes like scoring and segmentation. And if you've got a bunch of custom objects, it can be even worse. And you end up slowing down performance of those systems. If you've got a couple million records, you're probably experiencing something like that right now. Now, uh, and let's not forget the last one, my favorite, data hoarding. Um, each of these different technologies that I was talking about can have you know, as many as 200 or even more custom data fields that all get pushed into your core platforms. And so those can end up with thousands of different data fields with very similar names that, that nobody really understands uh, how they work together. You know, I, I've got one open price customer that has 10 different industry fields for a single record. Uh, so the reality is they, they can't use any of them reliably. And they've got six different sets of contact data for each record. So, you know, doing simple segmentation uh, is not a pretty sight. And the other thing that happens when you've got all this data hoarding going on is everyone's afraid to overwrite a record and try and create one golden record. Uh, that is the, the one that everyone follows. And so they just create more and more and more. And you end up like that client that I was telling you about. Now, when you've got all these things happening, what you end up is, is what we call a Franken texture of different solutions that, that aren't really scalable and aren't really manageable. And ultimately, the only way that you can really address all these issues is to come up with a really solid data management strategy. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, before we get into this, let's talk about what a comprehensive data strategy is. Uh, and I'm going to start by saying what it isn't. Um, there, there are companies out there that feel that they don't really need a data strategy. All they need to do is buy a bunch of data from a third-party provider. And, and don't get me wrong. Uh, data enrichment is really, really important. You need it for a variety of different things. But at the end of the day, that's not a strategy, and it's not going to fix the problems that you need to fix. Uh, you know, it's not going to help you with things like data normalization. Um, and, and I say this because uh, what we found through our own data marketplace and working with over 20 different providers is the typical match rate on a record is between 30 and 40%. Um, that causes all kinds of problems when you're trying to standardize. Uh, many companies decide that they need multiple data providers to kind of boost up that match rate. And when they do that, then they've got a standardization problem because each data provider takes a different take on each of their key fields. Um, and, and those data providers aren't going to help you with things like lead to account matching and, and duplication either. So uh, that's only part of the puzzle, uh, though an important one. Uh, the other thing that I hear about data strategies is, is some companies will just push it to an offshore team and let them manually try and keep things clean. And the reality is uh, the people that are working on this manually in those offshore teams aren't any more excited about doing those tedious jobs than you are. Uh, so there's going to be all kinds of issues in terms of consistency. Um, and the reality is if you've got millions of records in your database, that's not going to scale anyway. So it, it doesn't look like that. And a comprehensive data strategy also doesn't look like one guy going off and trying to take this on by themselves. That process fundamentally doesn't work uh, because your data is always moving between different systems, and you won't get very far if you're just treating this as your own special project. So what it actually does look like is a process that involves people, processes, data, and technology all wrapped up together. I mean, think about it. If you're in marketing operations and you're running a Marketo instance, you're pushing data back and forth to Salesforce and to, to your ABM product. Um, you're going to need to work with those people. Uh, sales ops and demand generation and the AEs and ADRs in the field all need to be on board with what you're doing. And not only that, but if you really think about it, you don't just want their buy-in. Uh, chances are you're probably going to want a piece of their budget as well to make a, a successful strategy work. So you want to bring those people on board. 
Uh, the second thing is about process. You know, think about how data flows across your enterprise. You know, a process as simple as bringing in leads from an event into your system can have ramifications way, way, way down, uh, down the funnel uh, if you didn't normalize the data on the way in and clean it up. Uh, and let's face it, most of us are running dozens, if not hundreds or even thousands of campaigns. That process can go way, way awry if you don't spend the amount of time documenting how your data should move through your systems. Um, same with things like just about what you guys do internally. You know, when does a lead become a contact? When does it get associated with an account? What needs to be an opportunity? And think about things like duplicates where you've got to figure out what the surviving record is. Um, most companies end up with a whole lot of duplicate records. Uh, deciding which information to keep and which to jettison is something that you need to decide with sales and marketing working together. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about the data side of the house and the different systems that you have that all work together and share data. Many of them have many of the same records and they also have their own versions and it's really important to sort that out so you know what the single version of truth is. And, and lastly, it, a data strategy includes technologies um, and not just things like, oh, well, I'm going to pull some data in from here or from there, I'm going to buy this kind of information. It also involves open data as well that you can get publicly available and also involves normalizing it to your specific standards so that everyone's on the same page and they've got a reliable system that they can work from. Now, uh, one more concept I'd like to touch on uh, before we move on and talk about what a comprehensive data strategy looks like. Uh, and that's this idea about how capabilities build on top of one another. It's not uncommon for a CMO to say that I really want to fix this process, and that process is a higher level process, like I really want to fix lead routing, or I really want to fix uh, how we target accounts. But the reality is you need to start small, crawl and walk before you can run and fly. So here's an example. If someone says to you that they really want to do a better job with account scoring, well, th that's great, but the first thing that you need to do if you're going to identify uh, look like contacts or look like accounts that you want to go after is you need to clean up your own database to find out what your current customers look like. And nine times out of ten, what a sales rep thinks is an ideal customer really isn't what bears itself out when you look at the data. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, every AE that I know uh, wants to target the CMO, but the reality is that person rarely does his own research. And the projects that, that they're using um, rarely start with the CMO. They start with someone at the director level or manager level who's championing our project. And those are the people you often want to go after first. Uh, many times when I go into a customer and we take a look at what their best opportunities look like they've closed, we find that there's absolutely no contacts associated with the opportunities. So they have no idea what's happening uh, to build those deals that close. So you've got to clean up that data first to normalize it. You need to go ahead and take a look and make sure that, that your opportunities have those contacts associated with them so you understand who's making the buying decision. And only after that, uh, then you can really figure out um, how you're going to target more of your ideal customers. Uh, and, and the same thing happens with an example like lead routing, as you can see over here in the run and fly part. Um, a lot of people find that they uh, they only – maybe getting 50% of the leads to the right person the first time, and you end up with lead pinball. Um, if you want to do that and you want to fix your lead routing problem, you really can't just say, well, I'll buy a lead routing system. Uh, that's not going to help you. You need to clean up your data first, normalize it, and remove the duplicates. You know, I, I, I see companies all the time where a lead is owned by one person, a contact is owned by another rep, and an account is owned by a third rep. So the probability of that lead in the right place is pretty darn low. So you need to clean up your data first, you need to normalize it, get rid of those dupes, and then you've got to do things like match your leads to your accounts and to your opportunities. And only after you've gotten all that done can you hit that higher level stuff like being able to route a lead to the right place. So it's a step-by-step -step process. You've got to do the basics first before you can do the advanced stuff. So, uh, so with all this in mind, um, I'm really excited to turn the floor over to John Donnellan from Serious Decisions, who's going to talk with you through how to actually build a data strategy. Tom? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Alan. Um, th that was great content there and uh, really some practical advice, I think, for folks to to think about when they're um, trying to avoid that, fr what would you call it, the Franken-architecture? Yeah, that was a great <laughs> word. What was that mashed up word? 
I love that. I love the picture. I love it. <laughs> Franken texture. There you go. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That that picture of the house was um, fantastic. And I, I have to say, I run into a lot of our clients um, when we first start working with them, and um, and their data looks like that as well. Um, it's not unusual. So for those of you out there that struck a chord, um, if it's any um, if it's any solace, you're not alone. Well, well, let's talk a little bit more about what the, what this comprehensive data strategy looks like. And um, and actually, before we do, what I want to do is take a little bit of a step back and, and share with you what we're seeing as um, the future of revenue technology, um, because I think that really sets the stage then for where data plays a role um, in, in all of that. And it kind of helps set the stage and I think give you a little bit of perspective. Now, what we're trying to do from a, you know, from a plumbing perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, is a few different things. So we want to be able to collect all this raw information that our, um, uh, that our systems and our platforms that we're using today are creating. We've got to take that information, be able to draw insights from it. Once we have those insights, we've got to do something with them. So, you know, the, these insights and these, this intelligence that we create is only as good as our ability to turn around and do something with it. Um, and so we've got to have that plan, and then we've actually got to drive the interaction. And the issue that we're seeing today is a lot of this is happening in siloed systems. You know, the great news in the last 10 to 15 years has been that marketing and sales and marketing have been free from IT to go out and, and build their own tech stack, to build their own uh, set of platforms. And that's been great, but what it's created is this proliferation of systems, like Alan was saying, that aren't necessarily connected all that well. And so, yes, we're doing these four things, but we're doing it within certain systems or maybe collections of two and three systems. So you take the marketing automation platform, for example. Um, yes, we are, you know, we're collecting information about open rates and click-through rates and drawing some conclusion about where that person might be in the buyer's journey and, you know, putting them into the appropriate nurture program and trying to drive interactions that way. But we're not really thinking about those across channels and across functions. And so what we're seeing is that organizations are moving to creating a set of horizontal technology layers that can work across the revenue engine. And by the revenue engine, I mean sales, marketing, product, and customer. So certainly there's the delivery layer. You know, these are the systems that we're using to interact with our audiences, with our prospects and customers. But sitting below that is... is um, is an orchestration layer, and this is really like the playbook uh, sort of layer, the if-then-else logic layer that will sit um, not just within marketing, not just within sales, so we're not just thinking about playbooks in the traditional sales sense of the word, um, or program planning for marketing, but it's going to look across all of those sorts of things, and it's going to say, okay, now that we know what to do, how are we going to deliver this content and these tactics across different channels that lead to a cohesive, seamless customer experience. But that orchestration level, of course, is built on a level of analytics. So, you know, we need to understand what's happening with our prospects and with our customers, and that is built on a layer of, of data. And so this whole thing sort of feeds itself. You know, the, as we have interactions with our uh, with our prospects and our customers, with our delivery systems, that's giving us data. If we can do a great job of curating that data, repairing the data, putting it all in one place so that it's easy to get access to, then we can put that analytics layer on top of the, on top of the data layer. Then we can figure out how we're going to act and react based on the insights that we're drawing. And then we can deliver those actions back to the, back to the delivery layer. So this is where things are moving. Um, we're, you know, there are analytics tools and uh, I would say the analytics layer has been around for um, a little while, but organizations are getting more sophisticated around that. Certainly the delivery mechanisms have been out for a while and people are experimenting with, with different things like delivering messages in cars and augmented reality and that sort of thing. But there is a ton of activity around the data layer right now. Um, and getting the data right is so critical and so important to everything that we want to do. So let's, let's go deep into that level. Let's talk about what a data strategy uh, looks like um, and, and how we can really bring that data layer to life. Now, there's a lot of detail on this one uh, particular slide, and I'm not going to go into all of it what I, uh, uh, right now. What I am going to do, though, is step you through what we call our data strategy implementation process. And it's a seven-step process, um, and I'll go into a little bit of detail about each of the seven steps 
Um, but as an overview, the first thing that you want to do is set up um, great governance, uh, cross-functional governance, to be able to look at the different data issues that you're having. Having done that, now you can start to, to zero in on the specific processes that are particularly reliant on, uh, on data. Um, these are the ones that we're going to, we're really going to focus on because, you know, we don't want to try and manage all the data for the entire organization. That's not what marketing or sales and marketing is really equipped to do. We want to make sure that we're managing the data that's appropriate for us. Once we have that, um, those processes set, we're going to turn back to our internal constituency, our internal customers, and get the voice of the customer. What do they want out of the data? Um, you know, I think a lot of times in ops, we have a tendency to just sort of assume we know what our internal stakeholders want out of the data, and we may be, you know, probably 70, 80% right, but it's always a good idea to, to turn back and ask them. So that's the third step. The fourth, then, is to go out and audit our current state. So if the third step uh, essentially gives us what we want, now let's go look at what we have. There's probably going to be some kind of delta there, um, and so that's what steps five and six are all about. We're going to go out and acquire the missing data that we don't have, put a plan in place to curate that data over time, the governance policies. And then the last piece is really around measuring the improvements. And, um, and as we'll see, it's not just the improvements in the data, but the outcomes that that, that better data is leading to. Okay, So that's an overview of the, of the process. Let's go a little bit deeper into each of these steps. Now, the first one is to create a governance structure. And this is you know, something we've been advocating for a number of years, and it's something that a lot of organizations are, are really um, moving towards seriously now. The idea here is that you want to bring together a cross-functional team that's going to be looking at the issues that you have around data. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what the, how this group should be comprised, ideally. You should have representation for marketing ops, sales ops, IT, legal or compliance, um, and then you want people from the business side of things. You want people that are dealing with the data every day. So you want demand managers on there. You want a sales rep on there. Um, you know, the rule of thumb is no more than seven people on a committee or a council just because it starts to get unwieldy in terms of setting up meetings and, and all that sort of thing. So you may have people that have to represent different areas of the business, different geographies or business units. But that's the idea. You want this, this blend of business people who can tell you why the bad data is really causing them headaches, and then the ops people who can, who can put a plan in place to, um, to go ahead and fix it. And one of the first things you can do at one of the first meetings when you all get together is basically show up with your shoebox full of gripes about the data. Get it all out onto the table and talk about it. And you can start to prioritize it. You know, look at, look at things in terms of effort versus impact. And you can start to see where the quick fixes are, the low-hanging fruit, and maybe what some of the longer-term projects are. Um, but it's really critical to, to get this team together, especially in this world where, you know, we're trying to drive alignment between sales, marketing, um, product, customer. You've got to get representation from all sides. Okay? So that's the, that's the first step. Now, one thing that a lot of our clients ask us about is, look, there's this big hairball of data. How do I start to unpack it? How do I start to categorize it so that I can manage it? And to the extent that I'm going to assign data stewards over parts of the data, how should I be looking at the data? And there's a few different options, and none of these is the one right way to do it. You know, it kind of depends on what's, what's right for your organization. We have seen a tendency for organizations to follow a certain um, path based on their revenue size. You'll see that in green at the bottom of each of these boxes. But one way to do it is to look at it by system. So, you know, you can think, well, we've got our marketing automation uh, data, we've got our sales force data, we've got product data, and to assign stewardship that way. So there is somebody that's looking out system by system uh, over the data. Now, it might be that one person owns more than one system, depending on how big you are. You might have multiple people, you know, owning the, the Salesforce application, for example. Um, but the idea is that you're doing it on a system by system basis. The second way of doing it is by function. So this, we see this at a little bit bigger companies. We might think, well, you know, we think about things in terms of marketing data or sales data, not so much system by system. And so in that case, you want to assign the stewardship over, um, over, uh, by, by at the functional level. Another way of doing it is at the data level itself, so the type of data. And we see this at even larger companies, and this is where you might see something like a customer master, where you've got a lot of information, both at the, um, you know, it combines contact and account information. Um, but the idea is that no matter what system it sits in, no matter what function is using it, there is a data steward that's looking after product data or transactional data, that sort of thing. 
And then the last approach is to do it by process. And this is really probably more appropriate for the GEs and the Toyotas of the world that are very process-driven by nature. They have business process owners embedded in the business, and with them there might be somebody who owns the data that flows in and out of that process. So, you know, a few different ways that you can start to break up the data, and as you're governing the data, you look to, to put governance in place, these are the ways where you can assign the stewardship. Now, the second step is to look at things in terms of processes. And uh, this is really important because a lot of times, uh, you know, we think about things in terms of function. And by the way, this, has, this is independent of how you think about things from a, a governance lens. This is more now about how we're going to identify the data that, that matters to us and the data that's going to be within our, our scope of governance. Um, you know, if we think about things function by function, you know, that's sort of a, a loose proxy for processes. But we really want to think about what are the things that we're doing? You know, what are the marketing activities that we're performing, the sales activities that we're performing? And sometimes those cut across functions. You know, they can span different functions. And so it's more, it's more instructive and it's more useful, it's more practical, really, to think about things in terms of, of processes. So, you know, I could just say, all right, well, Go off and figure out what your key processes are, and, and good luck with that. But what we wanted to do is share with you a little bit about what some of the most common sales and marketing processes are as a little bit of a, a primer for where you can start. So, you know, certainly marketing, market intelligence is one of them where we're trying to understand what the, what the market landscape looks like, what are my target accounts, those top 100 accounts, that sort of thing. That's very, you know, heavily reliant on data. Any kind of personalization you want to be able to do, on your website or even in your outreach, um, that's critically important. Lead scoring and lead routing, Alan had touched on these as, as processes that, that you might examine. So these are things that are, again, heavily reliant on data. Outbound outreach really harkens back to segmentation. And, you know, you'd be surprised at how many organizations you might shift a little bit in your seat as you hear this, but can't, can't tell the difference between prospects and customers. Um, you know, when you start to dig under the covers, the definition of customer, and I'm using air quotes here, it, you know, can be a little bit squirrely. Um, and, it's, and, and so getting just to that level of segmentation, surprisingly, can be difficult. Um, and then, of course, everything that comes along with reporting and analytics is very heavily reliant on data. So, you know, this, this obviously isn't meant to be the exhaustive list of all processes or activities, but it's a good starter list. And the idea is that you want to really kind of put the focus on what is it that we're doing and what's the information that we need to support those things. And that's really the next step is gathering that voice of the customer. So we want to turn back, as operations people, we want to turn back to our internal customers, our internal constituency, and ask them, what is it that you want out of the data? Uh, you know, don't just show up with a blank pad of paper and say, hey, what fields do you want? You know, that's, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't cut it. You know, first of all, you should show up with an opinion as to what, you know, what set of data that might be interested in. But you want to get a little bit more texture as well. And so one of the things that you can use, um, and a lot of our clients have used this is, uh, or something similar to this, is, uh, is an interview guide, a stakeholder interview guide. And so certainly we are capturing the data elements, the fields, the pieces of information that they want in that first column. But then we're adding some texture to that. We're gathering some extra pieces of information. Um, so you can see, for example, um, you know, hey, we want phone number. Well, you know, Alan, you, you would use the example of uh, sort of the other extreme of saying, hey, we've got six different versions of phone number in our database. We've got to be able to pare that down. In this example, you know, maybe it's that we just have one example, we, we, one field for phone number, and we are annoyed that the data vendor we're using overwrites it every night because as a salesperson, I just had a face-to-face -face conversation with this person. I know what, you know, he gave me his phone number. I went back and put it in the system, and then it got overwritten. So maybe we will add an extra field in this case, and we'll say, okay, there's the one for kind of manual entry, and there's the one supplied by the, by the data vendor. The idea there is that this is the kind of texture that you want to start to tease out. It might be, you know, around the company information. Like, obviously, yes, we want company information, but, you know, we have our own way of looking at that account hierarchy. And so when we capture it, you know, let's talk about how many levels of uh, children we have that sit under the parents and how those are organized for, for each account. And then revenue, you know, maybe we want to look at, um, you know, uh, the, the revenue that we're capturing for those accounts. Maybe we'll look at it as a specific number. Maybe we want it in revenue bands. But whatever it is, in this case, in this example, we're saying, I want to be able to change it. 
You know, I don't want to just see it on the screen and not be able to, to fix it. Again, if I just had a conversation with someone and they shared with me what their revenue is, I want to be able to fix it. So, you know, the idea here is that you're capturing a little bit more information than just a list of data elements. Okay, so that, that brings us from step three now into step four. So again, we've, you know, we've essentially gotten our, um, our requirements set. We know what we want out of the data. Now let's figure out what kind of shape our data is in. This is another tool, and it's a, a pretty straightforward matrix that you can build on your own. I've seen um, a lot of clients build this just in Excel after having done some, um, some offline analysis. But the idea is this, is this is a good way of looking at your contact database and finding out how many usable contacts you really have there. Um, and so, you know, the idea here is we're looking at a couple of different axes. We're looking at a level of completeness, and we could probably spend, you know, another 30 minutes after this call talking about how do you define completeness, but, um, you know, there are different levels that are involved, certainly, certainly the um, degree, whether you have compliance and you have opt-in as part of that compl uh, completeness definition these days, and then how recently have they engaged with us? That's the other dimension. That's the other access that we'll look at. So you can see there are going to be a certain number of records that are either way incomplete, that we just don't have enough information to be able to reach out to them and contact them, or and then there are going to be some records that have, are just too old. You know, they just, um, they just have not interacted with us for a long time. Now, we, in this chart, you, you can see that we created a breakpoint at 36 months in terms of where we define inactive. Our research shows that a quarter to a third of the contact database goes stale every 12 months. And so if you did nothing to it over the course of about three years, basically every record in there would be bad or would have changed. And that you know, kind of squares with reality. We all kind of move on, different jobs, different responsibilities, that sort of thing. So you know, it's up to you where you draw that break point, but the idea is that beyond a certain uh, point, the records are, are not usable. And by the way, when we talk about engagement, it's not how recently you've sent them an email. It's how recently that person has raised their hand and responded in some way. So, so that's the litmus test there. But the idea here is, um, okay, let's put aside all the old ones, all the incomplete ones. Now we've got these different tiers of usable records. And the ones in the, in the um, kind of gold and green there, those are records that we can use for our, those are usable records. We can use those for outbound outreach. The ones in the light blue there, the million and the 80,000, those are good candidates for enrichment. So you may want to work with a data vendor to fill in some of the gaps because they've engaged with you recently enough, but they just have not, um, they, we just don't have enough information about them to be able to segment them, put them in the right bucket, know what persona they are, and reach out to them in the right way. Okay? So pretty straightforward um, uh, way that you can um, uh, that, that you can analyze your database. There's one other thing that you can do in terms of an audit, which has been, again, really helpful for our client base, is to do what we call a port of entry analysis. Now, again, there's kind of a lot of information on this slide, but the idea is basically you're looking at all the com combinations, all the permutations of ways that data comes into your ecosystem. So we're looking at... Um, we're looking at the activity. So are we adding accounts? Is it, you know, offer responses that are coming back? The system or the port of entry itself where it's coming in? What the source is? So if there's somebody that's involved or a team that's involved, where that, you know, where that data is coming in, the type of data, and then whether it's manual, automated, or, or some sort of hybrid. So we're capturing all that information. And, you know, the same kind of information come, can come in in slightly different ways. So we want to capture the different combinations of those. And then what we're going to do is we're going to monitor the volume uh, and the quality of that data as it comes in over a certain period of time. A month is ideal. I know we don't all have a month to kind of sit around and wait and watch the data. So we've had clients do this on a shorter-term basis. But the idea is we're... We're capturing the volume of data that's coming in through all those ports of entry, and then we're also comparing it to the relative quality of that data. And so what we can do is we can take those two and we can, we can position them against one another, and we can build a two-by-two two matrix like this. And this really helps us identify where we're seeing large volumes of bad data coming into, um, coming into our system. So that would be the remediate box in this case. So you know, if you look at the two axes, we've got high volumes of low-quality data. That's that upper left box. Now, by contrast, where we have high volumes of high-quality data, that's the replicate box. So let's take a look at what's happening through those ports of entry because 
you know, either the people operating that port of entry are doing a great job or we have great governance or we've got great suppliers of data one way or another. That's an area we may want to replicate and can help us remediate some of the other areas. And then the other ones, you know, we'll treat as appropriate. Lower volumes of data, um, you know, where it's bad data, we want to tackle that next. Where it's high quality but low volume, we want to keep an eye on monitor that because uh, it's good for now, but it may go sideways if we're not keeping keeping an eye on it. So, again, just another great approach for you to be able to to take a look at um, where the data is coming into your ecosystem and what the quality is. We've had a lot of clients use this to, um, you know, not so much start from scratch because they have no idea where their bad data is coming from, but to validate the hunches that they already have. And sometimes they see new areas that they hadn't thought of. So it's a great tool that you can take back and, and use, um, that you can use immediately. Now, okay, so we've said, all right, we know what we want out of the data. We figured out how lousy our data is and how bad these ports of entry are. Can we finally start fixing it? Well, yes, you can in step five. So the idea here now is we're going to acquire and bring together um, our data sets. And there are a few different options for acquiring data. You can certainly go out and buy it. Um, you know, we're seeing less of that as an option, certainly in EMEA. Um, with the privacy restrictions, it's, it's not much of an option anymore to just go out and buy data. But you can certainly buy the augmentation, the cleanse and append services to the data. Um, most organizations are moving to, towards an inbound approach um, and trying to drive contacts that way. Um, because, you know, it really allows for people to say, I'm going to raise my hand myself, say, yes, I want to have a relationship with you, be maybe because you have an interesting piece of content or because I'm in the middle of the virus journey and, I, you know, I want to, you know, start looking into your solution. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, the other thing is a lot of times our best source of data is somewhere else in the company. You know, again, Alan, you used that example of having so many different records um, throughout the company and so many different values. If I have eight different versions of Alan's mobile phone number, you know, I need to get that down to a golden record, but my best version might be over in the customer care system because Alan just called up to complain about something, and as part of the process, he gave me his latest phone number. So, you know, I think a lot of times we think about augmenting our data with a third-party data source, but if we can bring our data together, um, sometimes we, we can put together that golden record just from different parts of the business and joining that first-party data. Now, I, wa I want to talk a little bit about u data unification um, because this is certainly a hot topic, um, and it's something that we're, we're talking about with a, a lot of our clients. Um, there are different approaches to bringing your data together. And you can see we've got another nifty two by two uh, grid here, uh, axis, maybe two and a half by two, something like that. Um, the <laughs> axes here are about the degree to which you're putting the data all in the same place. So that's the co-location, which gives us a 360 degree view. And then the degree to which we're normalizing the data. And Alan had talked about that a little bit um, earlier, you know, getting, getting things all in the same standard and the same format and getting down to that golden record. That's what the, the y-axis is all about. So if you have your data sitting in disparate systems and they're not really talking to each other, that's the lower left. That's isolation. So we have all these operating systems that we're using, um, but they're, you know, they're off in their own, uh, their own world. In the lower right-hand section, the co-location, now this is similar to a, a, a data lake kind of solution where, yes, we're putting all the data in the same spot physically, but it's not necessarily connected. So we've really done a lot to improve the ease of access to the data because it's in one physical data store, but we haven't connected it necessarily. So the flip side of that then is the upper left where we're synchronizing our data. Now it's not necessarily all in the same place. It may still be in those operating systems, but we're setting up synchronization. And there's a couple of different forms of that. We can have the systems talking to one another. So Marketo's talking to Salesforce and they're syncing back and forth a number of fields and Salesforce is talking to our social listening tool, et cetera. Um, so we can do that in a direct manner or we can use a service. So, uh, you know, a lot of third-party data vendors will say, okay, well, we will plug right into Marketo and uh, Salesforce independently, connect with us, and we'll, we'll cleanse and append and enrich the data in those systems. But you're going to kind of come to us as a centralized service, and we're going to push that clean data back to your operational systems. So those are the synchronization approaches. Now, the one in the upper right is really around master management. And now this is the idea where we're taking all our data from our operational systems 
It's running through some sort of ETL process, extract, transform, and load. It's going into a, some sort of hub, some sort of physical data store usually. It can, can be virtual, but it's usually a physical data store. It's getting cleansed. It's, we've got our golden record. And then potentially that information is pushed back to our operational systems as we need it. So if I'm the marketing automation platform and I gave you a half-completed record on Allen, you know, I might get back as part of the syncing process later on that day a fully complete record with an updated mobile phone number. So that's the master management. And there are different, you know, there are different architecture options for, um, for all of these. Um, but the idea is that one way or another, you want to achieve both that rationalization of values and, and if you can, get the data all in, all in one place because that just makes it easier for that analytics layer then to be able to tap into. Okay. So just a couple more steps here and then we're through. I know this feels like a long process sometimes. Um, the sixth step then is to put some processes in place to be able to curate the data over time. And there's a few different approaches here, and these are not mutually exclusive. So you may be doing some of these already, and there, maybe there's some new ones in here that you can look to add into your processes. But, you know, the best approach clearly is to make sure the data is clean at the earliest point of entry. So out at the perimeter of your ecosystem, Let's bring it in clean or immediately clean it um, as it's coming in before it hits those back-end systems and starts propagating itself throughout um, the rest of the company. So the idea here is that, you know, you've got controls on forms. Um, you might have some governance process in place in terms of how people upload lists, that sort of thing. Um, so the idea is that we're cleaning the data out at the perimeter, and we're doing that in real time, essentially. Another approach is to do that, do a similar sort of thing where we're cleaning the data. We're doing it at the back end and we're doing it essentially real time. Um, and so this might be where we have um, APIs with a data vendor. So yes, we let the data come through our form a little bit dirty, comes into our marketing our automation platform, but as soon as it lands there, we're going to do a call out to do those enrichment processes uh, and, and and create a clean record before it starts moving down the line, before we start um, scoring it and passing it to a sales rep potentially. We've also seen this done from a manual perspective. So I've worked with some clients that have essentially a manual triage team. So they are, you know, using some automated tools to try and clean the data, but then they've also got some, uh, some lookup uh, reference uh, tools as well, and they're catching anything that the automation may have missed and then passing it along. And then the, the third approach is, is to, you know, do your cleanup efforts, but to do it on the back end and do it in batch every so often. So maybe monthly or quarterly, you're sending part or all of your database out to a data vendor to be cleansed, and then, uh, and then it's coming back. Um, that used to be kind of the only way that we did it, and, and now we're seeing much more, um, m many more organizations move towards the real-time cleansing of the data um, because you just don't want to wait, you know, and it, and it only just um, creates bigger problems when you bring data in and it's not cleansed and it, you know, starts to make its way around the organization. So the last item in this, in terms of steps, is to measure everything that we're doing. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of organizations that we start working with are hung up on the idea of measuring the improvements in the data itself. And that's certainly important. You know, you want to know that the data is in better shape today than it was six months ago. But frankly, nobody else cares besides the marketing ops team. What we really care about is, is this better data giving us better business results? And so, yes, we want to measure things from a readiness perspective. You know, do we have more records? Do we have uh, more of the right kinds of personas? Are they more complete? But then we want to look at things like deliverability rates. You know, are we seeing fewer leads get disqualified for bad contact data? You know, almost everybody has that as an, uh, as an option in a drop-down list. Um, you know, are we seeing reductions in that? Those are activity kinds of metrics we can start to measure. But then even further down the line, we really want to look at output kinds of metrics. And these are our, a lot of our um, waterfall metrics. So are we seeing better conversion rates, higher volumes of leads? Are we seeing, um, you know, bigger deal sizes potentially? All those sorts of things are, are more towards the impact that we, um, that we really care about. Now, if you're, you know, if you're a serious decisions client or, um, you know, familiar with a construct that we have called the metric spectrum, these are three of the four levels in the metric spectrum. There's actually a, a fourth level of metrics called impact level metrics, and that's where our KPIs sit, you know, our top level metrics that we might have in place for marketing. The reason why I would caution you against 
um, measuring improvements in data against KPIs is that if you come to the QBR and you say, you know what, we improved the data and that's why revenue went up by 10% this quarter, it's just not a very credible uh, argument to make. You know, now certainly if you say, hey, we improved the data, here are those readiness metrics, that led to more efficient activity, which led to more effective output, now we're, now we're drawing a more credible cause and effect story. And, and then that better data probably was one of many factors, though, that led to increased revenue this quarter or, you know, given a lag time, maybe a couple of quarters down, down the pike. But you want to be careful not to draw that line directly too far. So be sure to tell the, the cause and effect story when you're talking about the improvements in data. All right, so the, the last thing I'd, I'd end with um, before I think we have a, we're going to have an opportunity to get into some uh, – some Q&A is to talk about what organizations, um, what some of the common traits uh, of a great data strategy program look like in organizations. So, you know, one is to start small uh, and build from there. Um, we always encourage people to pilot, pick a pocket of the business that is um, willing and able and, and will, you know, can share with you what headaches they're having with the data and will be um, helpful in, in starting to promote the improvements that we've seen. And that's the second step is to, you know, as you have those successes in your pilot, um, go out and get up on top of the rooftop and sing the praises of the good work that everybody has done. And I know that goes against the nature sometimes of ops people who tend to be a little bit uh, introverted, myself included. Um, but it's really important that we talk about the successes that we're having. And again, not just the improvement in the data, but how it's helping the business, how it's helping what we're doing from a sales and marketing uh, perspective. The other thing is have a sense of urgency. You know, don't just sit back and expect this all, all to kind of happen on its own. You want to work quickly. You want to put the improvements in the data, stay close to the people that are using it, measure those results, quickly promote what's happening, and then feed that back so you can continue, um, you can continue to improve things. You know, I've been part of enterprise data warehouse implementations, and these things, they, they can die, you know, they can get collapse under their own weight, kind of die on the vine, just to mix a couple of analogies there, um, because it, there's no sense of urgency. You know, it's sort of we're trying to tackle all the data for the whole business, and, um, you know, we're setting up these huge governance structures, and it's, it's just not, um, not productive. We're not seeing enough traction early on. The last thing I would say is, you know, especially as you pull together that governance council Put a little skin in the game for the people that are serving on that council. As you're starting to develop the charter for what that group is going to do, pack that into the goals and objectives of those individuals for the year so that that's part of how they're measured. You may very well have to take something off their plate in order to add participation in the Data Governance Council, but that's okay. This is important. You know, this is found foundational and fundamental to what we're trying to accomplish here um, as a business. So, you know, try to work towards these traits as you're working through this, this data strategy. Now, I know I went through a lot of information. I probably went a little bit long as well in terms of uh, the time frame we were trying to stay, stay within. I think if we do have time, we can get to uh, some Q&A. Um, but I appreciate you hanging in with me and my, my rapid pace delivery here. And, and Alan, happen to, happy to answer any questions, uh, and Karen, that we may, may have gotten over the course of the last uh, 40, 50 minutes. Awesome. Hey, hey, thanks a bunch. This is really fabulous content. Uh, there are some next steps here, but I've got to tell you, I think that the, the very best asset that, that you can have is to get a copy of this presentation in John's seven-step program. Um, that is a really fabulous blueprint to creating a data strategy. Uh, if you'd like a copy of those slides, uh, all you need to do is send an email to info at openprizetech. Open prize is what you see in the bottom right side of the screen with the words, uh, letters T-E-C-H dot com, uh, info at Open Prize Tech, um, and the folks here are happy to send it your way. Uh, a couple tactical assets that also might be valuable as you start to build up your data management strategy is it's very easy to benchmark exactly where you are in your marketing or sales automation solution um, for products like Marketo, Salesforce, Eloqua, Pardot. You can get a free data diagnostic that will tell you exactly how good your data is, you know, how many missing records, uh, how many duplicate records, and that sort of thing. Um, and all you need to do is a request a free data diagnostic. Um, the second asset that's valuable is this really simple data governance template. Uh, and we have these for all of the major marketing automation and Salesforce automation solutions. 
All this document is is a simple spreadsheet that has all the key fields, who owns them, what kinds of values will, be, will they be included, and how often will they get updated. That makes it much easier to have a conversation with all the different stakeholders about who owns what and, and how they're going to manage those things. And, and the last thing, if you're interested in data orchestration solutions, and these are solutions that automate all those painful manual processes that solutions like Salesforce and Marketo and Eloqua don't, you know, things like cleansing and enrichment and account scoring, all those things are in a data orchestration product, and you can get a demo of that just by registering on openpricetech.com. Uh, all three of these assets, I believe, are available on the homepage, uh, so you won't have to dig in too much, but there's also a bucket load of great resources in the Resources tab on the Open Price Tech website. So with that, uh, I will turn it back over to Karen, and we can talk about some questions. Great. Thanks so much, Alan, and thank you, John. You both did go through quite a bit of information, great tactical and strategic information for our audience. And we do have questions coming in. So audience, we do have you know another eight minutes or so that we can take your questions. So get yours in if you want us to get to them. John, I have something really simple. I'm not even uh, going to put it up here on the screen. During your last few slides, uh, one of our attendees asked what you meant by a sender's score. Can you maybe just clarify that for a minute? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to. I actually, you know, Alan, I might kick this to you as a as a marketing guy. You're intimately familiar with uh, what <laughs> that is, and you can uh, speak from experience what it's like to have a good, maybe, and bad sender score, and how that impacts your marketing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if you guys think about the data that you have um, and who you're emailing. Um, one of the things that everyone cares a lot about is, is your own personal credibility and how you as a company email folks. If you continue to email people that have left the company, um, that's a sure sign that you're really not doing your part. Um, and many different systems are going to say to you, hey, wait a second, that's probably spam right there because that guy keeps sending emails to people uh, that aren't in the company and are bouncing or someone who's already opted out. So it's just one facet of data quality, but it's really important over the long haul that you've got really great quality data. It affects your, your deliverability. It affects um, the relationship you have with your best prospects. Um, and so this is just one small part, but it's a really, really important one. Great. Well, I thank you to that attendee for bringing that up for us, because obviously there was more to it than I thought. Good. All right, let's get to our next question. And that's going to be about this whole idea of a single source of, oh, where'd it go? There we go. Sorry, everyone, had a little bit of a flip there. Here we go. Um, both of you, I'm sure, will have a view on this. Does it matter where the single source of truth data resides? Uh, we talked a lot about golden records, single source of truth. Alan, I'm going to let you start with this because I know the term single source of truth was, was back in the beginning towards your presentation, and then we'll have John chime in. Sure, absolutely. I, I think what, what, what this viewer is asking about is, is a classic example when you have systems like uh, a marketing automation solution and a Salesforce automation solution. There's a huge amount of overlap between those two solutions and the records that are within them. And I think the real question is, well, if you're going to designate a single source of truth, does it matter what that is? And, and my view is the answer is no. What does matter is that everyone agrees on what that single source of truth can be. You know, we have customers here at OpenPrize where their source of truth is Marketo, and all the systems are pulling information from that. I've got other customers that believe Salesforce should be where their golden record resides, and they focus on that. Um, what is important is both is that the folks in marketing, the folks in sales agree on what that is. Now, I will say what, what typically happens is you start cleaning up one system or the other, and then the folks on the other side of the fence, whether you start with sales uh, force automation or with marketing automation, very quickly see that the grass is green on the other side, and they want to take the same strategies with their database as the system that has the system of record. So uh, the important thing is folks have a long conversation about this on where they want that golden record to reside, and then they start there. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you, Alan. And, um, you know, a lot of times it comes down to, um, 
you know, you say you pull together this data governance council that's going to look at things across the different groups. And the fact of the matter is, at any company, there are people that have a little bit more enthusiasm for this sort of thing than others and a little bit more maybe credibility within the business to to push something like this forward um, than others. And so, you know, does, you know, is this data store managed more by marketing ops than sales ops? There really isn't a right answer. And it do, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of more around, you know, what person or kind of cluster of people have the, have the passion and competency um, around it. Um, you know, it, it is an interesting question, though, and with all of those layers that I had shown in the beginning, it raises some questions and says, all right, if, if we are going to build these layers that cut across our different functional groups, who manages that? You know, like who, who buys the system? How do we decide who selects it? Who pays for it? Who stands it up and maintains it over time? And so, you know, that kind of gets us into a little bit of a discussion around uh, a newer topic um, of revenue operations, which is something that we explored a little bit at our um, at our U.S. summit. We'll be doing a little bit more at our TechX event um, in December as well. Um, but the idea there is that, you know, it can range anywhere from uh, what we call the coalition of the willing, where it's, you know, sort of a group of people that are aligning really well, all the way to, you know, revenue ops being its own function. And maybe all all the ops teams are are reporting up under one person, um, and then some, you know, some varieties in between. But um, the idea is that those groups together have to look at these issues, and then, you know, where the source of truth is and who manages that system, it to some extent is neither here nor there. Yeah, you know, this is a really good point. We, and I've seen cases where it goes either way. Um, I, I I love your comments on how. Oh yeah, you know, it, it's. Uh, you know, it's really up to, you know, who's focusing and who has the resources on it. Um, what I've often seen, too, is that the people who go first tend to be the ones that have the most business pain. If folks identify a lead routing problem, then, yeah, sure enough, the folks in sales ops working on Salesforce are going to take the charge and they're going to want to get rid of their dupes. They're going to want to uh, be able to match all the leads to accounts and, and, and focus on that to route them to the right place. If the business pain is on the marketing side where they're trying to do much better segmentation, then, then marketing is going to lead the charge. So I, to, to our earlier point, I think it's only a question of, of having everyone agree on who's going to go first uh, and where that golden record is going to sit and, and who's got the, uh, the bandwidth uh, to kick off a project and get it moving. Yep. All right. Um, we're really coming up on time, but I just wanted to get this out there uh, in terms of how to start. John, you talked about this a little bit, but very quickly from – from both of you, John, I'll let you start. Does this take a long time? Where can you start if you've already got some of this going? Um, do you have to start at the beginning? Maybe just a 30-second advice from each of you for our attendees. Yeah, um, it doesn't have to take a long time. Usually what we do when we start working with clients is we'll look at those seven steps. Most people are doing a little bit of those seven steps to some degree, so we'll look at the biggest area of pain. Um, you certainly do want to go through it in order, so it's important to get that governance set up first. Um, but it doesn't have to happen. Um, it doesn't have to be an 18-month journey, um, especially when you look to pilot and then and then uh, spin things up um, further and extend things from there. Alan, you know, I yeah, I, I certainly agree with, with with John's insights on this. But the reality is, these things don't have to take a long time. The hardest part isn't the configuration of the systems and getting them up and running. You know, we, we can do that in a matter of days. The hard part is about working together with the different parts of the organization that are all part of revenue ops and getting everyone on the same page about what's going to happen and the ownership part. Um, nine times out of ten, that's what we see as, as the hard part. Uh, the having the systems aligned to do these different processes is the easy part. So, you know, going in from the very beginning with the buy-in from the different teams is a critical part to help you get a project off the ground and and, uh, and being successful quickly. All right. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. I want to thank John and Alan for a very informative and timely presentation. And thank you, audience, for your great questions. Uh, Alan gave you the information for some great follow-up information at the openpricetech.com website. So please check out there if you uh, want to visit some more information. And, of course, uh, John is with Serious Decisions, and you can check out that website as well. I want to give a special thank you to Open Prize for sponsoring our webinar. And, uh, again, you can see their website information right here on the slide.
That's all for our broadcast today. We look forward to seeing you next time right here at Digital Marketing Depot.